How many is ready for a comeback? Come on. I'll take that. Hey, for everybody watching online, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in. If you've got a prayer request or a need, just let us know. We want to pray with you and believe with you. Wherever you're watching from, just kind of let us know. Say, give us a share. Give us a like. And to you, thanks for coming out today. You look good? Hey, today, I want to start a brand new series called Making a Comeback. And you ask, why, why do we want to talk about a comeback? Because everybody has setbacks. You ever notice what I'm talking about? Everybody has setbacks. And if you're going to have setbacks, it's important to know how to have a comeback. You know, but think about it. Before you have a setback, you usually have hope, inspiration. You're excited about something. You're making your plans. You're dreaming. You're setting your goals. You're enthusiastic. You're looking forward. And while all of this beautiful stuff is happening, then all of a sudden something happens. We have this setback. Maybe in your marriage, maybe you've had a setback in your marriage. I've never met anybody that says, hey, let's get married and have a bunch of setbacks. No, no, nobody ever gets married. Everybody gets married with the hope that, that this is going to be something really special and beautiful and forever. And then unfortunately, somewhere along the way, we often have setbacks and maybe it didn't end in divorce, but for you, you know, the counseling isn't working, the books aren't working, and, and you're just feeling like, okay, I, I, is, are we just stuck? Is this all we have? Is, and so maybe you're just coming to the realization that maybe, maybe this real marriage will never be everything that I wanted it to be. Or, or maybe you had the courage and you, you started a business and you leveraged things and you've taken big risk and maybe you overcapitalized yourself and maybe even left a secure job to start this business and you're working long hours and all of a sudden the return isn't there and, and the bills are piling up and maybe clients aren't paying and all of a sudden this enthusiasm of being your own business entrepreneur is facing now with all of these challenges or, 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 or maybe this was going to be the year of your sobriety. This is going to be 2020 was the year I was going to be sober. 2020 was the year I was going to distance myself from my addictions and my habits and hurts. And, and instead of being the year of your sobriety, become the year of your relapse. And you found yourself maybe even more in bondage than you were before. See, we all have setbacks. Maybe in our health, we wanted to get in shape this year. You know, back in 2020, you're like, I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to lose so much weight. And you didn't lose weight. You gained weight. You know, you went in the wrong direction right there. Maybe, maybe you had health issues and you thought you would get better. And instead of getting good reports from the doctor, you got bad reports. Are you encouraged yet? Now, how many know we have, we have setbacks, but here's the question. Everybody's going to have a setback, but here's the question. When you, when you personally, when you personally have a setback, how do you handle it? What do you do? See, do you get discouraged and disappointment? I get that. I get dis I, I hate setbacks. I don't like setbacks. I get frustrated. But do I quit? Do you quit when you have a setback? Do you just like throw in the towel? Is this, is this, this is what it is? Or, or, or do you just blame? Are you a blamer when you have a setback? You know, you, know, the, you blame the forces that are against you. You know, the movie Star Wars, the, may the force be with you. You're on the other end of the force. The, all the forces are against you. People are against you. Your spouse is against you. The neighbor's against you. Even your own kids against you. Your parents are against you. The boss is against you. The government, of course, is against you. The Democrats are against you. The Republicans are against you. The media is against you. The liberals are against you. The conservatives are against you against you. The devil's against you. Even God is against you. Come on, somebody. Is, is that the way you handle a setback? Are you a blamer? Or do you attack yourself? Are you, are you the person that attacks yourself? It's like, oh, I can't believe I'm so stupid. What an idiot. I can't believe I did that. I, I deserve this somehow. Why, why did I even try? Why did I even think this would work? Why did I even take that risk? Why did I even want to believe? Why did I even want to hope? And you just beat yourself up. Listen, listen very carefully. When you have a setback, it's critically important that you don't take another step back because you'll get in the habit of turning around and going back. Because when I don't know how to go forward towards my goals, my dreams, and my preferred future, when I don't know how to go forward, there always is the tendency to want to go back. The children of Israel... Every time they would have a step back, every time they would have a conflict, every time there was a challenge, let's go back to Egypt. 
Egypt represented low living, not high living. Egypt represented bondage, not freedom. Egypt represented being victim, not victor. Egypt represented living below God's plan for their life versus living in God's plan. So whenever you have a setback, don't take a step back. Instead, get ready for your comeback. See, God is the God of comebacks. We love comeback stories. Come on, right? You love comeback stories. In sports, we love, I love every time Russell Wilson has a comeback game. I, I love in business when you hear of the comeback. Steve Jobs gets fired from Apple only to come back to make it one of the profitable, uh, most successful companies of all time. So people have setbacks. We love comeback stories. The person who lost everything through their addiction and somehow got their hands around it and overcame and regain their life. See, God is the God of comebacks, and he wants to give you a comeback story. I don't care what situation you're in. You might be in the middle of your full-blown addiction. You, you, you might be in the worst challenge of your life. You might be buried in more debt than you've ever faced in your life. You, you, you may not know which way to turn. You may feel like everything is against you, but I am telling you, God is the God of comebacks. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 5, and I know he's a God of comeback because I've had so many setbacks in my life. Have you ever noticed that people who have setbacks and comebacks, it becomes a pattern in their life? Some people have setbacks and they don't know how to come back, and that's what we're going to talk about. But look what the scripture says in 1 John chapter 5 in verse 4. It says, for whatever is born of God, I like the way this translation says, for I, I, can, I can relate to a whatever. I'm not sure. Sometimes it's a whoever, but in this case, it's just a whatever. It's like, God, I, I, can, I can identify. I'm not sure what I am today, but if I'm born of you, I'm born to overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world. What? Our faith. Listen carefully. If you are born of God, you are born to be an overcomer. It is in your DNA. Your Lord and Master Jesus Christ is the greatest overcomer of all time. You have his spirit in you. If death knocks you down, God says you're going to rise back up. You were created by God to be an overcomer. But notice what overcomes something on the inside of us. Look, I have a, I have a brand new basketball right here. Brand new. What are basketballs supposed to do? This basketball has a problem. It's brand new. But I also have another brand new basketball. What's the difference between these two brand new? It's what's in them. What's the difference between the person on your right and on the left of you right now? It's the air in them. See, what you can't see with your naked eye is when this ball hits the floor... You can't see it, but it's distorting. It's distorting at the point of impact. But because of the pressure that's in it, that air has no place to go, but back to the point of impact. And that makes it have a comeback. It makes it bounce back. And how many know the harder I throw it, the harder it hits because of the pressure in it, the faster it comes back. The harder it hits, the higher it wants to come back. See, when you learn to cultivate your faith on the inside of you, you'll become a comeback artist. You'll become a comeback kid. God wants you to become a comeback specialist. He don't want you to be in the habit of going back. He wants you to be in the habit of coming back. We all have setbacks, but over the next several weeks, I'm going to talk about the habits that help make us strong or habits that help us have successful comebacks. See, habits are little things that make big difference. And you can cultivate the habits that will help you have comebacks and bounce backs because because God wants you and I to become back specialists. Come on, somebody. So I want to look at the story over the next several weeks of the story of David. And we're going to look at this story, and I want to encourage you as I get ready to get into this series, 
right now in your mind, just make a commitment. Say, you know what? I'm going to be here over the next several weeks because, because once you learn the principles of being an overcomer, you'll use them over and over and over and over again in your life. And we're going to take some time and just teach on these. And I want you to gather the information. I want to encourage you. I, I, want, to, I want to impart some things to you because I believe that God wants you to be an overcoming people. I believe he wants us to be an overcoming church. And we're going to learn some things that David did. And so the story's found in 1 Samuel chapter 30. And it goes this way. It says, and David and his men came to the city, the city Ziglag. And there it was. They come, it's been a three-day journey. They come home. They want to be with their families. But it was burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. How many would say this is a setback? But this has only been a series of setbacks for David. If, if you know the story of David's life as a young boy... He is this rising star. I mean, everything is going his way. He, he's in this situation where he gets anointed to be the next king of Israel as a teenager. How many know that's a word from God, that you're going to be great? You're going to be a leader of my people. And, and he's such a talented musician that he's so talented, he gets to go play for the king. He's playing in the king's palace. And he's an incredibly gifted young man. And, and then he goes to see his brothers one day on the battlefield. And, and they're there, but he sees this giant named Goliath. And he says, is anybody going to do anything about this giant? And he's not even in the army yet, but he goes out there with a slingshot and destroys the giant. And, and because of this, he has this incredible promotion that comes into his life. They, they make him a commander in the army. They move him into the king's house. He's sitting and eating at the king's table. He gets to marry the king's daughter and they begin to sing his praises that Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And he's not even in his twenties yet. And, and life is just moving forward for this young man. He, everything he seems to be doing, it all seems to be falling into place. He's, he's in the palace. He's in the kingdom. He's being groomed. He's growing in his leadership. He's got favor on his life. And then it happens. He doesn't have a setback. He has a series of setbacks. Anybody, have you ever noticed that setbacks usually don't come one at a time? They come more like a pack of wolves, you know, and wolves keep trying to surround you and come after you. Ever feel like you're in that situation? It's like, can I, can I catch a break anywhere? So, so all of a sudden, all of a sudden, Saul turns against David. So now he's playing, and instead of it bringing peace to Saul the king, Saul now begins to throw spears at him while he's playing. Come on, somebody. We don't do that to our band around here, thank God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He, David says, I'm in trouble. The countenance of the king has turned against me. He, now he knows he's got to start, he's, he, he knows he has to leave, and he runs for his lives, and He's living in caves. He's no longer in the palace. He's no longer eating the king's table. He's living in caves. And Saul and his army is pursuing him. It gets so desperate that David has to flee his own nation that he loves. And he becomes an expat. And he goes into the country of the Philistines. And, and he's trying to find a place to be there. And while he's on this journey, he's got nobody. But people started gathering around him. And here's what the Bible says about the people that started gathering around him. He's got a few hundred people around him. It says that they were in debt. They were distressed and they were bitter in their soul. This was not the greatest people to be around. But when David was done with them, they become great leaders. But that's another story for another day. But when he first got around them, they were not great people to begin with. And so he's got this ragtag group of, 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 of people around him. And, and now he has to leave his nation. And, he, and, he, and he's brought before this one Philistine king. And, and, he, and it's, it's not going really well. And so he gets so desperate in the meeting with this king, he starts acting like a madman and he starts scratching with his fingernails the wood at the gate and he begins to spit all over himself. And the Bible says his saliva is all over his beard and he's playing the madman. Here's my question. Have you ever been so desperate, you've done desperate things to start surviving and just preserve? And this is where the anointed, the king, were singing your praises. You're eating at the king's palace. You're married to the king's daughter. You're such a talented musician. Now he's playing 
the madman. The king says, take this man away from me. Why does he play the madman in front of me? And then David finally carves out a little city called Ziglag in, in the country of the Philistines. And he starts settling down a little bit. But he comes home after a three-day journey. And when he gets there, now the city is burnt. He has no family. He has no possessions. He is literally homeless. The men that he's with are now speaking of stoning him. It doesn't get any lower than this. This is literally the lowest life could be for him. But in the next several verses, David did seven things we're going to talk about. And here's what it goes on to say in 1 Samuel chapter 30 and verse 18. But David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, son or daughter. David recovered all. How many know that God wants you to be a comeback specialist? God wants you to have a comeback story. I don't care where you're at right now. I don't care what challenges you're facing. I don't care how many things are against you. I don't, I don't care what obstacles you're facing. God wants you to be a comeback specialist. And over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about it. But I do want to mention number one today. Here's the first habit you and I need to cultivate that we learn from David. is the habit of encouraging yourself. It's the habit of encouraging yourself. Look what the scripture says here in 1 Samuel uh, uh, chapter 30 and verse 6. Now David was greatly distressed... For the people spoke of stoning him. I mean, you know, that would be distressing. Come on, somebody. They didn't say the people spoke of getting stoned with David. No, no, what do you do to encourage yourself? What do you do to encourage yourself? Do you medicate? Do you just tune out on video games? Do you just... Do you just bear yourself in your work? Do you, do you, just, do you just get lost in a, a new relationship? What, what do you do to encourage yourself? David, he's got everything going against him. Everybody's speaking of stoning him. And at this very low point in his life, watch, David had something his enemies could not take away from him. David had this little thing that made a big difference. David knew how to encourage himself. It says in Psalms, or Samuel, verse goes on later in this verse 6, it says, for he, David, encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Oh, come on, somebody. See, here are some things that David did to learn how to encourage himself, and you, need to, you and I need to learn how to do to encourage ourselves. Here's the first thing David did. He took it personal. In other words, your encouragement, you need to make it personal. You need to take it personal because David has no one to encourage him. In fact, they're speaking of stoning him. So David has no one to encourage himself but himself. Here's what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes because how many know it's nice when you and I can be encouraged? How many like to be encouraged? I mean, I think all week long, what I can say to you, try to encourage you. Encouragement is a big thing. I believe in the power of encouragement. The Bible says we are better together. But here's what it says. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. How many times has somebody helped get you up? Somebody believed in you? Somebody encouraged you and it strengthened you and it helped you get a little further down the road? I hope that's what I do with these preachings and teachings to you that get you a little bit inspired, helps you get a little further down the road. If you're down, it helps you get back up. But woe to him, woe to him, who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Woe to the person who is alone when he falls because he has no one to help him up. Listen carefully. There will be times in your life you will feel like I have no one. You'll feel like there's nobody there to encourage me. There's nobody in my corner. There's nobody for me. There's nobody with me. It may not be true, but you will feel that. You will sense that. Maybe, maybe there are people around you that are saying encouraging things, but it don't feel encouraging. I've been saying encouraging things to you for, for 20 minutes now or 15 minutes now. You still might not feel encouraged. There are woe to the person who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him get back up. Sometimes you got to know how to get yourself up 
And this is where you have to learn to make your declaration of your faith in God. And that's what David had. David knew how to encourage himself in his God. Let me say it this way. My faith needs my confession to become my encouragement. My faith needs my confession to become my encouragement. This is where I make the confession about what I believe in God, what you believe in God. I'm not talking about saying stuff for the benefit of other people. I'm not talking about confessing for other people. I'm, I'm, how are you? I'm fine. That's great. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about what you say, what you say to yourself about your God. Years ago, I did this series about the love of God. And, and every week that we started that series, I would have people say this phrase, God loves me, God cares about me, and God wants to help me. And I would ask people to say it back to me. And they'd say, God loves me, God cares about me, God wants to help me. I'd say, okay, you're not convincing me. Say it like you're, I'm trying to get them to repeat it because I know that if you hear yourself say stuff like a song, it gets stuck in your head. So I'm trying to help people get this phrase stuck in their head. And so by the time we're done, God loves me, God cares about me, and God wants to help me. They're, they're preaching at me as hard as I'm preaching at them. And, and so they're learning this phrase. And, and we would do that every week. And, and we would say it throughout the message. And, and people learn that phrase. And, and during that teaching, there was this young woman that came up and started talking talking to me and she just looked like a heavy spirit was on her, just a weight of life on her. And, and, and she started saying, Pastor, I, I don't know much about God. I've not really been around church. I don't know what it means to be a Christian, but that phrase is helping me. And she begins to tell me her story of what she's going through and the painful place that she's in. And, and she goes, I remind myself every day, God loves me. God cares about me. And God wants to help me because she didn't have no source of encouragement anywhere else in her life because of the abuse that she was going through. I saw her about a year later and she come up to me, she goes, do you remember me? And I says, I'm sorry, I don't because she's light, she's lit up, she's got this new countenance, there's just something about her, she don't look like the same person. And she goes, we had a conversation and she starts telling me the story and then I immediately remembered the story. And she goes, for the last year, she told me her story. I just kept reminding myself that God loves me, God cares about me, and God wants to help me. And, and I'm in a new place. I'm in a new chapter. I've grown in my faith. I'm growing in my walk with God. And, and just a new place that she's in. And, and that's the power of creating a confession that feeds your faith. And this is where you make the confession. When, 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 when you, you say, God, I believe in your goodness. God, when nothing around me feels good, I believe in your goodness. God, I believe in your grace when nothing seems to be going in my favor. I believe in your grace. This is where we start making the declaration that, God, I, I believe in your wisdom when I can't figure life out and I don't know what's going on and nothing seems to be make sense and your ways are very confusing to me, but I'm going to trust you anyway, God. I'm going to make this declaration that I trust you, God. And, and, and when, when I don't feel uh, that I'm going to make it and I feel powerless, and I feel like I'm struggling, I'm, but I'm still going to declare you're going to make a way for me, God. I'm declaring that some way, somehow, all things are going to work out for my good. It don't make sense right now, but I believe in your power. And you learn to create that confession in you. This is you, you start confessing what you believe about God because trust me, when you have a setback, you will start confessing what you believe about God. When you, when you, have, when you, when you take this flat ball over here and, and it... This is actually the good one. <laughs> I can tell. A, when you, all, of a sudden, all of a sudden, when you have that point of impact, all of a sudden, there's a reason you're not coming back. Because, because at the point of impact, God, why have you let me down? I knew I couldn't trust you. Church is just full of this kind of people. See, at the point of impact, what you really believe, you will confess. What you really believe will start coming out of you. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so then faith, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes 
by hearing. You need to hear it. You need to hear it. You need to hear it. So let me ask you this question. Who's your favorite preacher? Who's your favorite preacher? Some of you are so nice. You're saying, you are Pastor Dave. Come on. No, no, no. Listen, listen. Somebody say, no, T.D. Jakes, man. T.D. Jakes, he is a preaching machine. Others, Stephen Furtick or Jensen Franklin. I, I've got some men and women that are just incredible communicators and incredible teachers. But listen, your favorite preacher should not be me. Your favorite preacher should not be one of those people. You should be your favorite preacher. Yes, I said that. I'll say it again. You should be your favorite preacher. You should be able to preach to yourself that gets you so inspired that you're ready to take on hell with a water pistol. Get yourself so inspired, you're ready to, you're ready to take on the devil. You're ready to move mountains. You're ready to walk on water. You, you need to be able to preach to yourself that gets you up, gets you encouraged, gets you lifted, gets you renewed because that's the power of your confessing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Your faith, listen, your faith needs to become your best friend. And some of you you need to help your friend change or we could say your belief system some of you some of you you, you do preach to yourself you just you're just not a nice preacher to you you are such a worm you're so low you're so terrible you deserve this what's wrong with you you can't seem to get it together God don't even like you why should you even try you, you need a new preacher <laughs> you you need a new preacher, I'm telling you. You need to change churches in your head. Come on, somebody. You need, to, you need to like yourself. You need to preach to yourself so that by the time you're done preaching to yourself, you get yourself up. This is why when you sing courses, when we sing hymns and we sing worship songs that's why have you ever noticed that you start singing those and you just start feeling lifted you you just start feeling inspired you just start feeling hope again well why can't you do that it, 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 there's a course we sing around here called Waymaker. it says way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that's who you are even when I don't see it, I know you're working. Even when I don't feel it, I know you're working. My God, that's who you are. Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. See, do you know how to preach to yourself? Because there will be times in your life Mama isn't there to encourage you anymore. Your spouse isn't there to encourage you anymore. Your, your pastor or your favorite preacher isn't there to encourage you anymore. And you have to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and say, you need to sit down. I got some things I need to say to you. I got to preach to you today. I got a word for you today. And you need to start preaching to yourself. I deeply believe what I'm telling you. As a young leader, when we started Capital Christian Center, I quit my job. I bought a house. And we've got a few people attending. We moved into this little building. And, and little did I know that they sold the building. We didn't have a place to go. And, and I was so freaked out. Oh, I cannot tell you how freaked out I was. It's amazing how little the problems were, how big I freaked out. And now my problems are much bigger and I freak out less. Because God grew me on little problems. Oh, come on, somebody. But I remember I walked around in prayer, and this is all I said in prayer, pacing back and forth. David, have faith in God. David, have faith in God. It's one of the greatest sermons I've ever preached. And that's all I said. It is, it's true, because it changed my life. It changed my life. And all I did with David, and there was nobody there but me and Jesus and whoever else was listening through the windows or something. But David, have faith in God. By the time I was done preaching, David has faith in his God. And I began to confess to myself. I began to preach to myself until I began to believe that God had it under control, that I believed God was for me, that God was with me. See, this is why you need to be able to encourage yourself and preach to yourself. Your faith needs your confession 
to become your encouragement. Learn phrases that inspire you. Learn scriptures that teach you the very nature and the very character of God. And use them. Use them, not like this flat ball. Use them at the moment and the point of your distortion so that you can have a bounce back. Because guess when you need to trust God the most? When everything around you seems shaken. Guess when you need to believe in the love of God the most? When things feel unlovable. Guess when you need to believe in the power of God? When you feel the weakest. Here's what the Apostle Paul said about being able to believe. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, even he, the context of this is he's praying and he says, Satan had sent a messenger to buffet me. He had been going through blow after blow after blow, setback after setback, and he's praying for help. And here's how God answered him. He says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Do you believe that? Paul did. Here's what he went on to say. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Therefore, come on, give me, please, my next screen, please. Therefore, I take pleasure. I take pleasure in my infirmities, in my reproaches, in my needs, in my persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Well, some of you need to believe that. When I am weak, I am strong for Christ's sake. When I'm being persecuted, I'm getting ready for my comeback. When I'm, being, when I'm in need, I'm getting ready for my comeback. His strength is perfected in my weakness. My God, that's who you are. That's what you do. You help people like me. I don't know why. You're a good God. Here's the second thing David did. David tuned out painful distractions. At this point in his life, he's got them speaking of stoning him. And I think we need to learn from our setbacks. We need to learn from our failures. But we don't need to camp there. It's amazing how many people want to camp in their misery. Learn from it. Learn from it. And learn how to move on. Learn from it. And learn how to grow. But don't camp there. Just because you failed doesn't make you a failure. Just because you relapsed doesn't mean you're stuck in your addiction. Just because the finances didn't go the way you want doesn't mean you're not going to get out of debt. Learn and go again. Bounce back. Bounce back. And to do that, David had to turn out, tune out all the critics, tune out all the naysayers, tune out all the people who were thinking, you're nobody. Why did we follow you? Why are we here? And you've got to learn how, listen carefully, to tune out the negatives when COVID hit this year back in March I made a decision actually a little bit before that I made a decision I wasn't going to listen to very much news in the last year I've probably not heard more than a couple hours of news I know what's going on it's not hard to know what's going on I still haven't seen the video of what happened at the Capitol I've heard about it just haven't seen it. Well, you're just putting your head in the sand. No, I'm not. I know what's going on. I know there's racial tension. I know there's political tension. I know there's an economic divide. I, I, I got it. I got it. Here's what I do know as a pastor. I meet with people all the time who have bad news in their life. I meet people whose marriages are falling apart. I meet with people whose kids have cancer. I meet with people whose careers are in really struggles right now. I meet with people who are trying to figure out how to, how to get out of their addiction. I hear bad news all the time. So if I turn around and I'm nursing on bad news, how am I going to help people who have had bad news to have good news? I need to turn around and feed on some good news so that I can tell you it's going to be all right, that God is for you. If God is with you, who can be against you? That you can be the head and not the tail. How do I know? Because I'm tuning in. See, see some, of you, some of you need to say to the critics, and you, gotta, you just got to say, shh, shh, shh. Stop talking to me right now. Stop. Just be quiet. You know who you need to tune out? Sometimes you need to tune out the critic in you. It's not your spouse. It's not your boss. It's not your co-worker. It's the critic in you. You need to stop. 
just be quiet right now. Be quiet right now. Because I think the Spirit of God's trying to say something to me. Shh, be quiet. Because He speaks in a whisper. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of God says. This whole year, my prayer was God. Every time I listen to what's going on, the it's like the apocalypse. It's the end of the world. It's all going to end. It's, it's just terrible, terrible, terrible. But no, dog, when I read your word, your church is an overcoming church. Your church is the head. Your church is a prevailing church. Your church is a glorious church. If I listen to them, it's different than what you're saying. So I better stop listening to them so I can be what you're saying. Here's the third thing that David did to encourage himself. He tuned into God's vision or God's purpose for his life. Remember, as a teenager, he gets a word for his life. David, you will be king. I'm anointing you to be king. And when it was highs, highs, and low lows, David had this vision that he would not let go of. God has a plan for my life. God has a purpose for my life, and I'm not going to let go of it. That word, encourage, it's the Hebrew word, hazak. Yeah, say that. It's like clear your throat. Hazak. Hazak. And it's this long definition. It means to seize, to take hold, to lay hold of, uh, uh, to be courageous, be strong. But right in the middle of all of that definition, right in the middle of all of that definition, if you'll see it, it's the phrase, play the man. Is it right? It's literally what that word is to encourage yourself means play the man. Not fake it till you make it, but become the man. This is powerful. See, this means God uses vision to move you through process, to take you through a process of becoming. When someone goes into basic training, they're not a soldier when they go into basic training, but they become one when they come out of basic training. Oh, come on, somebody. When you go in, they take away your hair, take away your clothes, take you away from your mama. They take your first name away from you. You're private somebody now. Come on, as a pastor, I see these young men, they go off to basic training and they come back and all of a sudden they, they got new posture. They got new manners. They, 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 they got new confidence about them. They got a new identity because they went through a process. And some of you don't realize you're in basic training right now and God has spoken a word over your life and he's trying to get you to become something. He's trying to get you to grow into something. And if you let go of the vision, you'll let go of. See that phrase, hazak. It's what God said to Joshua when he says, Joshua, be strong, be hazak, be strong. To this day, when Jews read the Torah, the Old Testament, when they get through reading it, they say, Hazak, make it so in me, God. I'm clinging to it. I'm grabbing it, God. May I be that man. May I be that courageous. May I be that woman. It's the declaration. You've got to make the declaration. I'm going to become what God has called me. Think about this. David is literally homeless. He has no family. He has no people. He has no status. He has no resources. And at that moment, he says, even though the kingdom has never been farther away, today, today, I need to act like a king. Today, I need to act like a leader. Today, I need to act like a champion. Even though those men don't believe in me, even though my family's been taken away from me, I have no nation. I have nothing. I have nothing. Today, today, I play the man. Today, I act like a king. Today, I believe I'm an overcomer. I'm not faking it till I make it. I whip until I have no more power to weep. I'm not denying the facts of my life. I'm not trying to hide anything. But today, there's something in me. I know who I am. See, my time is up, but let me say this. When people have setbacks, they often ask two questions. Here's the first question. Why? Why is this happening to me? Why me? It's a question of despair. Why is a good question, but in that context, it's a question of despair. Here's the other question. What am I going to do? It's a question of hopelessness. But in a different context, it's a good question. Let me give you a third question, which should be the first question. If you get the first question right, It'll help you answer the other two questions. 
instead of why and what, it's who. Who do I want to be? Who do I want to be? I want to be a good father. If I want to be a good father, now I know what to do. Why do I want to do it? Because I love my kids. I love my family. I want to be an excellent husband. Well, what do I need to do to be an excellent husband? And why do I want to be an excellent husband? Because Kelly deserves the best. She chose me, so I want to be the best for her I can be. I want to be a great leader. I don't want to be a mediocre pastor. I don't want to be a mediocre leader. I'll be on, I want to be a great leader. Well, what do I need to do to be great? I got to show up in crisis. I got to be strong when everybody else is feeling weak. I, I, I'm not talking about faking it till you make it. I, I, I got to be because I know who and I got a why. And the why keeps me going. The why becomes the engine that keeps me driving. Is this making any sense? See, God will use vision to help you no matter where you are. He did it with Abraham. He did it with Simon when he became Peter. He did it with Gideon when he became a mighty man. God will use vision to encourage you. And when he gives it to you, you got to hang on to it. When he gives it to you, you got to believe it. It's your identity of becoming. You're in a process. You're going on this journey. So let's stand to our feet. I want to pray with you. I'm praying and believing for your comeback. And maybe you don't need one today, but someday you will. And when you have that setback and there's no one around to encourage you, now you know how to encourage yourself. Let me just pray. Father, right now, whether they're watching online or whether they're in this room, I thank you, God. Your word tells us that we, if we're born of you, we're born to overcome. So I thank you this is a room of overcomers. This is an audience of overcomers, God. Come on, church. If there's an area of your life that you're being distorted by impact, can I just ask you to reach out to God in faith right now and to make your declaration, God, I don't understand what's going on, but I trust you. God, I'm in pain right now, but I know you love me. God, I don't have answers right now, but I'm pressing you'll give me direction. Start making your declaration of faith over your situation. Start making your declaration of hope over your challenge. And then watch God begin to show up in your life. Begin to tune out the critics. Begin to tune out those voices, even if it's your own critic. And become the preacher that inspires you. Become your favorite preacher. Become the leader that encourages you like nobody else can encourage you. When there's no one else around, when there's no other voices in your life that's building you or strengthening you, allow yourself to hear the word of God out of your own mouth. Hear the promises of God out of your own mouth. Hear the inspiration of God out of your own mouth. Father, I thank you for the ministry of your spirit. I thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you're here and you don't have a relationship with Christ, simply invite him into your life right now. All you have to do is just say, Jesus, be the Lord and Savior of my life. Jesus, come into my life. Watch God show up in a powerful way, miraculous way, but you've got to reach out to him. Father, I thank you for every business leader. I thank you for every marriage. I thank you for every person that might be struggling in addiction, that this is a family that's going to encourage one another, and we're going to become strong in the Lord. We're going to become strong in you. Wherever people are being distorted, Father, the, the pressure of the Spirit of God on the inside of them is coming to bear on that moment, and they're having their comebacks. I'm declaring this. I'm believing this. I'm asking for this in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Come on, church, let's worship the Lord. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today. You know, we're going to continue this conversation over the next several weeks, and we're going to continue to talk about the habits that help us become strong, the habits that are going to help us be victorious and have a comeback in our life. And we're here to partner with you. If you've got a prayer request or a prayer need, let us know. Our team wants to pray with you and believe with you. If you've got a story of a comeback, share it, testify. We want to hear from you. Also, you can continue to follow us on Facebook and 
Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We wanna stay connected. Even though we're in this time of the pandemic, we're still gonna stay connected. We're still a community. God's still doing great things. And as always, thank you so much for your kindness and generosity, partnering with us, helping us get the gospel out. Hey, I love you guys, and we'll see you next time.